morning. Welcome to uh, NORCAT. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for a, uh, uh, our Hot Topics presentation with Karen Shulman Dupuy. Um, so just real quickly, I'm going to introduce Karen. Uh, Karen is a business designer with a specialty in digital and social media who brings her extensive experience in the fields of sales, education, operations, process design, business analysts, analysis, project management, marketing and communications together to guide businesses on how to design their internal efficiencies to create external opportunities. It's quite nice. the mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> she is an entrepreneur and an award-winning communicator who has worked in technology since the 1990s and with startups and entrepreneurs for almost 20 years. So please. Uh, well, let me welcome uh, Karen to the stage. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. It's so funny. Even if it's like a small group, everyone sits in the back, right? <laughs> I'm so afraid to get near the front. Uh, I'm just going to bring this up here so I can also read because, you know, after all those years working with startups and whatnot, my eyesight is not quite what it used to be. So uh, I thought for a change, actually, this year, we would start with... Uh, looking a little bit back to last year. Oh, you know what, clicker, there we go. And I always forget which one it is. Look at that, I figured it out. Um, so take a look at what we talked about last year and do kind of like a little review and where things have come from last year. So uh, the first thing we talked about was the attention web. So that was about long form storytelling and about this, you know, where people talk very much presumptuously about, you know, that the attention, there's a, there's a lack of attention, uh, audiences are very quick, uh, they're not committing to those long form storytelling. Uh, the attention web was actually all about that. It was about actually measuring the long form story and about people taking more time to actually read content that they had to invest more in. Um, so, and we're seeing, we're seeing that continue. Of course, this is, a, this, you know, trends don't stop and start at the beginning or end of a year. Uh, you see that this, most of these actual trends are actually continuing straight through. Um, death to clickbait, that I was really happy to see it was basically a fait accompli. Last year it was basically realized, which is a good thing for all of us. Um, so uh, part of the response to the clickbait upworthy type of articles that you saw a lot last year uh, was due to Facebook actually penalizing marketers and people who were posting content. Uh, they would actually... Um, pull that content from people's news feeds and so it would get less organic play. So certainly Facebook had a lot to do with kind of killing that kind of really lazy marketing and really lazy storytelling um, by just trying to fool people into clicking on content as if the clicks was what mattered. Uh, storytelling, of course, that's never going away. That's something that I think has, it has always been part of actually a really good brand story and really good marketing story. Uh, and what you'll see now is you'll see companies like Vice who are doing that long form storytelling and they're doing it in, in, a couple of years ago the word was transmedia so it was in a trans way that it was not just uh, not using it just within apps or not just within website stories and and not just within video it's actually utilizing all of those different platforms and telling the story across multiple platforms so that kind of a long form storytelling is absolutely still happening uh, crowdfunding is still is still an animal uh, we talked about last year the example I gave was Canada land which is a podcast that's run by Jesse Brown which is awesome uh, and I'm a big fan and I also also supported on Patreon. So every month I give a donation um, to support that content being produced. Um, what's happened though since uh, he launched Canada Land is he also has launched Canada Land Commons, which is a show about politics. And then he's also like imminently, I think he's probably hit his 100%, he was like 99.87% or something the last time I got an update on launching a, an arts and culture show as well. So um, both of them will be crowdfunded um, and supported that way. So it's all audience driven, which is pretty amazing. Podcasting absolutely is taking off again. It's uh, the growth has been huge over the last year. Uh, lots of new players coming into the uh, into the play into the playground, I would say. Um, and so podcasting isn't going anywhere again. It's it's been really enjoying a really quite a renaissance. So it's ha I'm happy to see that continue. Video, of course, I've got some updates actually this year on video. So we know that this is still actually a very powerful medium for telling, uh, for telling brand stories and for engaging with audiences. And so that there's a new kind of twist to it this year, which is fun. Uh, measurement and dashboards still progressing. Um, there's still a lot of room to grow for people. There's still a lot of places. Numbers scare people, quite honestly. 
And you know, they just people hear data and they kind of get the big eye and they step back or they go, I, you know, I just don't understand it. I don't see it. So there's been a there's been a move from measurement like pure numbers into more of um, the dashboard view, which really is about translating those big data numbers into bite sizes of information or or putting it into into visual formats that most people can understand without actually having to be data engineers. So which is great. Uh, mobile, of course, is still the number one push for anything online. It really is. The numbers are growing uh, almost exponentially. B2B, still seeing a lot of activity where a lot of the stuff, we have an update uh, today as well, where a lot of the progress that's happening in the social and the digital sphere is actually in and around enterprise, so which is a, a nice change. And uh, that notion of design. So design has gone from this idea of um, you know, kind of a typical graphic designer and, and, you know, people have that kind of a mindset. We talk about the, the design jobs of the future. We're talking about uh, virtual reality designers and augmentation designers. So it's actually changing and, and uh, it's, it's going to be expanding that kind of definition of what design uh, will look like moving into 2016, of course, and beyond. All right, let's go take a look at, so what we're calling, what we're looking at as some trends coming up for, um, that are really taking off this year and what's actually moving ahead. Um, so the first would be professional services. So it's been really interesting to see the advent of, um, of Legal X, which is out of the Mars Discovery District, and so of course everyone who knows Don and myself knows this is near and dear to our heart. Uh, so Mars has actually launched Legal X this last year, and this is really about disrupting the legal space. So um, it's not about doing law in a new way. That's not it. It's about actually how you manage a law office, right, or how you manage law IP. So this is much more. When I talked about that, you know, that B two B kind of changes happening to B2B last year, and we're seeing it way more this year. It's like insurance, accounting, real estate, law, like they're all looking at ways to really disrupt, <clears throat> excuse me, and improve in the way that they actually go to market themselves, right? So how do they communicate with their clients? How are they providing extra value to their clients rather than just the services? Uh, in the legal services field, that kind of transparency is really important. So people really want to be able to manage their own billing they want to see exactly what they're paying for. So it's getting, a, you know, from, from the law profession side, it's got to be really trying and really annoying. Um, but from, uh, from the consumer side, I mean, that's really what's, the, what's pushing that kind of change and that demand. So they're, they're looking at more transparency. Um, there's operational opportunities, of course, within these, all of these fields, right? So about actually improving the communications between a law team and, um, and the client, uh, as well as them taking some ownership and uh, some uh, accountability and some opportunity for them to actually manage some of the own, their own inputs in regards to their cases. So uh, a lot of the work that I was looking at most recently was in regards to specifically like personal injury lawyers, right? So how, what, can, what kind of research can the client do to help their case along rather than just being dependent upon the law, uh, the law office to do that, all of that research on their behalf? So the tools that they're actually building and that they're kind of disrupting um, everything from, let me get my list here. So we're looking at like online dispute resolution, the, uh, the case management, document assembly, um, databases and analysis. Like so this is all the non-sexy stuff that when people say, like, what are you doing for me? What am I getting paid for? Like, that's all the behind the scenes stuff. So that kind of transparency is certainly growing uh, in, the, in the professional fields, which is great from a consumer perspective, of course, right? That's really where the changes are happening. So we're looking at a lot of business processes being changed. So has anybody used Slack? Anybody heard of Slack? Right, so Slack is awesome. And it's, you know, it's just an instant messaging platform, essentially, but it's very robust. And the team behind Slack are actually amazingly responsive, which is great. Uh, and they are, you know, you can create a team and have everybody collaborating on content. You can be doing video messaging and, uh, and, and engaging with one another. So that kind of that line of communication. So think about it from a legal, uh, a legal environment. You can actually have a Slack channel for your case. Right, so you can so you can have a law firm has its own you know predominant like corporate channel, and then everybody's you know having those communication channels. But then you can actually have one for your case, so everybody associated with that case could actually be in that channel, and you could be servicing your client that way, including the client. Right, so you can actually have it from an internal and an external perspective. They have it managed so as well, so that you can actually have internal and external permissions. Right, so that you can actually give people that kind of access. So you could have a case; it could be like internal, you know, confidential, and then it can be external, so that the client can participate. So those 
those kinds of things are changing. Like, so you don't have to, you know, a firm, an accounting firm, an insurance company, a law firm, they don't have to go in and create their own app, right? Which everyone goes, oh, like, let's create an app, right? Um, they're not necessarily, and the apps cost anywhere between 25 and 50K to actually create a good app. So why do that when you actually have this kind of service, pay for the professional services? And they've actually integrated them in a really, really smart way, right? So it, it's not about necessarily branding it for yourself, right? You don't have to necessarily do that. Um, and then you have companies like DocuSign. So Docu DocuSign is um, using elect electronic signatures for contracts, right? So, um, I mean, oh my God, I'm gonna, like 10 years ago, I actually worked on implementing one of these systems. Uh, it was before DocuSign. DocuSign wasn't the company, but um, in uh, telecom, which was exhausting uh, to integrate it. I mean, you know, now looking at this kind of platform and the functionality that it has and, and the security and the legality as well, of course, is there. But the ability just to send somebody a link, have them actually do a virtual signature, have it be accepted legally right across Canada, right across the US. Uh, I'm not sure about global standards. I'm sure that they're I'm sure that it's incorporated, um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, then you, you, you know, you, the that ease of use between those environments, right? It becomes very, very easy, um, and then it just improves the interaction between a client and a, and a professional services provider. Uh, Plum HR, um, or so I think it's it's not Plum HR, but it's Plum uh, out of out of KW. Um, so they're looking at the hiring process, and what they do is they actually uh, do a whole vetting process and then a whole talent management process as well. So you know, just easing up like that very laborious, you know, traditional kind of having a recruiter going through every single submission and whatnot are, are no longer kind of the way that people are dealing with uh, managing talent acquisition. So those kinds of tools are also coming. Um, directly, which is a customer service platform that allows a team of people to respond to customer service requests. You know, so these are these are not necessarily sexy things, right? But when you're when you're the business and you're working internally, this is really sexy to you because this is the stuff that actually helps you along and it helps you every single day, right? So um, so the business processes, that stuff, the operational stuff that people don't really pay attention to, um, but is really important to obviously uh, anybody's kind of workday. All right. So messaging apps. So who uses messaging on their phone? Everybody, right? Um, well, you'd be surprised at actually what messaging apps are looking like moving forward, right? So uh, if you look at them, just take, like, take one second just to, to read that line. So we have three billion users and counting who are using a messaging apps currently. And uh, this is going to obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, continue to grow. So yeah, the user base is bigger than all of Christianity. Like that's the impact of these tools. And when you put it into that kind of scope, it actually resonates, right? When you see the movement and how many people are engaged in these different platforms. Um, now certainly, you know, here I've just highlighted kind of the North American ones, right? But there's also WeChat and, and, uh, and Viber and a, whole, and a whole bunch of other ones, of course, that are making up that user base. Um, but the thing is, is that it's not just messaging, right? That's, it's not just messaging that's happening here. So anybody use Snapchat? Do you, right? So is anybody unfamiliar with Snapchat? So Snapchat is a place where you actually have these very quick videos or images that only last for a few minutes um, and then they, they disappear. So Snapchat did of course go through a little bit of turmoil over the last couple of years when they realized that their stuff was not disappearing, so that's problematic. Um, they're working on fixing that apparently. I mean that will always be, you know, there's never, never, ever, ever, ever trust a claim 100%, like ever. Nothing is 100% anything. Ever, ever. Always have your critical thinking mind on, okay? So, you know, choose to share your content wisely with that knowledge. Um, but, so, you know, Snapchat is fun and it's, you know, hearts for eyes and vomiting rainbows and everything else. And you think, but like, how are we actually using this for business? And the crazy thing is actually people are really using it for business. So, um, you know, 200 million users and counting for Snapchat. 
and their growth is massive. If you actually lay this across um, some of the other growth of different social platforms over the number of years, it's actually astronomical. Uh, their growth trajectory versus like Facebook's. You know, you know. I'm sure you've seen kind of the the graphs from before where it talks about like the adoption of radio, right? And then the adoption of computers, and then it's like the adoption of TV, and then the adoption of mo mobile messaging. Like the numbers are are exponential, right? So um, kind of a little bit like Metcalf's law, right? Everything is. It's n to the power of two, right? Everything is growing that fat, that much faster. Uh, you know, computer chips are getting that much smaller, but that much more capacity. Um, it's the same sort of thing with these platforms. Like they, they're, they're tapping into, they're tapping into this ease of use, and that's really what people are responding to the most. So when you look at Snapchat for business, so if you look on the, on the right side, you can see that these are some of the organizations and companies that are actually utilizing, um, they're calling it Snapchat Discover, right? So you can actually get it. So how are they using it? There really is, it's about relationship building, influencers, celebrity insights, behind the scenes stuff, limited time offers, right? So this is, it's not for everybody, for sure. Like I can't really see lawyers quite honestly, like using Snapchat, right? But if you're a retail outlet or you are a live event space, uh, you know, you have, you have tours coming into town and you want to do a little behind the scenes, you know, view from, from that kind of perspective, like those kinds of insights are actually really working and it's that relationship building. So it feels very intimate too because it's a one-on-one, -on -one, right? Your experience is one-on-one. -on -one. It's not you sitting in a room like Periscope where you're actually watching, you know, everything happening, right? So if anyone's not familiar with Periscope, it's a, it's a live broadcasting app that allows you to actually, so I could sit here right now, open up my phone, and throw on Periscope and you guys could be broadcasting me versus it being videotaped for, for uh, later viewing, right? So, um, so it's those kinds of things. And they're getting like, so Cosmopolitan, right? Is getting three million views a day using Snapchat, right? So that's, it's an entry point, right? It's not, it's not a solution. And this is where I was talking earlier about kind of that, no, that notion of transmedia, right? Trans platforms, it's not the solution. It's part of a solution. It's part of a plan to actually integrate you know, talking to different audiences in different ways. Now, this is where you have to do your homework, right? You have to know who you're talking to, what's your demographic, who's your age bracket. Like, you're certainly not going to be necessarily getting um, a, a more senior demographic using Snapchat. Just the users aren't there. Right, so knowing who you're talking to and knowing which platform to utilize for your business is always obviously the most, that's, that's where the work comes in, right? That's where it's, it's less about guessing and it's about knowing who's, who's on which platform and where your audience is and going after them in the right way, all right? All right, so the thing that you may not know about these platforms is actually how much can be achieved in these platforms. So just take a look. So these are the things like these are the things that you can do within WeChat. These are the things that you can do within like you may not be able to do them all in every single platform, but they enable that. Right. So, again, this is that kind of uh, this. There's this idea and you'll hear me say it a few times, but there's this idea of friction and then this idea of frictionless. Right, so obviously friction is bad, right? Friction is bad in the sense of when you want people to adopt things or adopt processes. Because friction means that there's something that's stopping it from moving fluidly. A frictionless experience is when you actually are able to take something and actually seamlessly use it. And there's no, there's no idea or, or there's no blockage for you moving into one realm or another realm, right? So using these messaging chats, I mean, or these messaging apps rather, people are sending money to one another. You know, they're sharing content for sure. Um, they are engaging in multiplayer games or single player games. They're calling cabs, right? They're, they're consuming content and they're doing it all within that space, right? So that's where the value is of these messaging apps, that it becomes this very uh, contained environment. So of course the caveat there and the danger, of course, is that it's a highly curated environment, right? So. Uh, there's a great TED talk, and I can never remember the woman's name, um, but it's, uh, I think the title is Take the Other Side Out to Lunch. 
And you know, there's a danger when you're, whenever you're using anything in a curated environment, whenever you're solely in, a uni, in, a, in an environment, like Facebook even, right? If you're only getting your information from Facebook, you are definitely getting filtered information, right? It is, it is not an open environment in that sense. You are absolutely getting a certain perspective. Two different Facebook users will get two entirely different kinds of feeds because they have different interests, they click on different things, they like different things. So there's a definite filter happening in that environment. So even in these messaging apps, you know, you have to be mindful. Like if you're using this as a source of information, a source of news and, and keeping you informed, not perhaps the best choice for you, right? Because you're actually not getting diverse views. You're actually not getting um, anything that challenges your comfort zone and what you already know. So, uh, you know, what, where these environments from a user perspective or from a, from a provider's perspective rather, that's very beneficial, right? Like, Facebook never wants you to leave Facebook. Like, they want you to stay in Facebook and do everything. And if you look at their plan, what they're doing and what they're creating is everything to make sure that you never have to leave. You can buy gifts in Facebook. You can get your news out of Facebook. You can watch videos out of Facebook. You can do everything within Facebook. They don't want, and then they have Facebook Messenger, right? And then they have, the, uh, then they have WhatsApp, right, which is their, another messaging app. Right? They also have Instagram. So like your whole content consumption experience can be maintained within the, those boundaries. Good for Facebook, not necessarily good for you. You never hear the other side of the news, you never hear the other perspectives, unless you're actually actively engaging with that and asking for that. And the reality is, is that most of us don't play in that way. Right? Most of us don't want to be disrupted. Most of us like to have our own biases reinforced. We like to have our own, you know, validation. So if you know, if you just even you look at the American. Um, uh, their presidential bids right now, right, that are going on in the nomination process, you know, you can either get everything Hillary or everything Bernie, or you can get everything Ted Cruz or everything Donald Trump. Like, and the, all that does is reinforce for you how right you are in your perspective. Right, so because we're all right, um, so I so I always throw that out because I think it's really important to have an open mind. I think it's really important to once in a while like somebody that you really don't like, like follow somebody that you really don't like, because I think it makes it for um, an enraging at times, most certainly, but a very much more informed kind of social experience and online experience that you're actually getting the other side of information, right, and informing how you actually really feel about things. All right. So, uh, money, 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 money. Money is changing a lot. Digital money is changing a lot, and there's a lot of changes coming on. Um, so this is just an example of what's going on in the fintech space. So when I say fintech, we mean financial tech, right? So you think seriously, like how can you be disrupting money? Um, in a lot of ways, actually, digital money is going to be, uh, it's going to continue to be huge. So. We have, um, so I'm sure everyone's heard of Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's kind of taken, a, it's gotten a little quieter over the last year, right? It kind of exploded in 2014 and, and then it was really, really on the news a lot and there was a lot of conversation about it and there was a lot of kind of inside, you know, scoops going on about who was the creator of Bitcoin and whatnot. Still yet to be determined. We don't have a full answer on that one yet. Um, but when we're actually talking about disrupting fintech, we're actually talking about it in a very semantical, how it touches every consumer's lives way, right? So it's less about the Bitcoin and, and you know, this kind of niche market of like dealing in cryptocurrency. We're talking about like changing of experiences in retail and personal finance and lending. These are the things that are actually changing a lot. The stock markets are actually changing because of technology and those are being disrupted as well. Anybody read Flash Boys? Oh my God, great book by, I think it's Michael Lewis who wrote Moneyball as well. It's about this great Canadian this nice, and literally in the book, he's called the nice Canadian uh, who worked for RBC down in New York on the New York Stock, Stock Exchange and actually identified how um, the markets were being manipulated based on um, fiber lays, like we all know this world, right? So based on fiber lays and, and, and traffic routing um, and how it would impact um, the public markets. Uh, so he's actually, you know, it's a long story. I'm not going to ruin it for you. It's a really fascinating story. I think it's going to be a movie. Um, but uh, I'd love to see the nice Canadian guy win in this sense. Um, but he's actually responsible for disrupting the way that the entire stock market runs um, out of New York. 
So, uh, and has created his own stock market in that sense as a response to this. Um, so, I mean, those are the bigger stories. Those are the, like the big kind of, and they're hard to get into because there's so many details and they're very complex. Um, that's just one example of where FinTech is actually, things are happening and disrupting kind of the, the, that stayed industry as it has been. Um, but we are looking, like crowdfunding is part of FinTech, right? So everyone, anyone heard of a GoFundMe? Anyone heard, right? So somebody gets hurt, somebody you know, experiences a tragedy or a loss, or somebody needs some help, and then people's community will rally around them and they will help fund them. So it, you know, Kickstarter and uh, Indiegogo, absolutely amazing products, still enabling creatives and entrepreneurs. Um, it's not a business model, let me say this as an aside. right? Like Kickstarter and Indiegogo are not a business plan or a business strategy. There's certainly a means to help validate it, a market exists for somebody's product, right? So when you see stories of like, I, so I have this water bottle, it's a collapsible water bottle, um, and called Hideaway, and that's awesome. Uh, but it's not a business plan, right? Like they, they went something like crazy 300% or something of what they were going for for their target, for, for their funding, and they reached it and they got it and everything else. It's not the way that they can sustain a business. It's a short burst that allows them to actually validate that there's a market out there for their product, and then they actually still have to build their business around it. So it's not like a business plan, right? I just want to clarify, because some people think it's like, oh, as soon as I Kickstarter, then I'm running. No, it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a one step in the process. Um, but you know, the advent of Kickstarter and Indiegogo, I mean, those things have enabled businesses that never would have existed before, right? So that's just, that's just on the crowdfunding space. Um, or as I mentioned already before with podcasting and Patreon, right? Um, that you, know, you have creatives that are actually making an annual or a monthly living, making a salary, because they actually have the support of an audience who is willing to pay for content. So when people say you know, content creators aren't getting paid, people are willing to pay for content. It just depends on the content, right? They they're not doing the spray and pray any longer. We're being very much more deliberate with our choices. So crowdfunding actually enables that, and, and those kinds of sustaining platforms really help with that as well. Um, Everything, though, from uh, one of the things I find is really fascinating, of course, is the lending space. But we'll take a look at that in a second. So, of course, you know who's freaking out are the banks. The banks are freaking out, um, and they're—I mean—they're not—they're not not doing anything. They are responding, right? And they are getting involved in their own way. Um, but they're so they're kind of working in their own scope. Um, but it's really it's really the disruptors who are working more on the you know on the personal line of credits or the personal line the personal business right and the personal lending um, that's where the real disruption is happening and that's because they're more malleable. But I will say this: I actually ran into um, representatives from Scotiabank re recently. And Scotiabank is always one of those banks that actually surprises me. Like they're you know kind of quiet on the Canadian scene, right? Like they're not the bank that actually does a lot of flash, but they're probably one of the more innovative banks I've ever actually come across. Like they are really really progressive, and they are actually funding um, an innovation group within the bank right now, which is like a startup within their own framework, which is really unique for any bank to actually invest in that. And it's like it's almost like pure R and D. Right, where they're just like, have an idea, see an idea, run with the idea. Um, and they're not being constricted or constrained by the rest of the culture within the bank, right? The bank, as we you know, like to think of them in that sense. So really interesting to see some of them, I, I think, are more malleable than others, for sure. Um, so the P2P lending, so peer-to-peer. So, um, so Zopa and Prosper are two uh, platforms, one out of the UK, one out of the US. And these are actually about people lending money to people rather than going through a bank, right? So very much, though, capitalizing on these models that have existed for decades, right? So the CSA model, the, uh, the Community Supported Agriculture model, I've written about a friend of mine um, who runs a cafe in Stratford, so I live in Stratford. And true story, she went to go get a, a, um, a leasehold improvement loan. Uh, she took over, she was taking over a brown space that had been a brown space in the middle of the heart of, of downtown Stratford, like right behind City Hall, right in Market Square, this beautiful old building that had been sitting dormant for decades. And so she wanted to revitalize it and expand her business, expand her business. She had realized something like 300% of growth for her core product um, over, I think, two years. Um, and, and was just like growing every single year, like quarter over quarter, like absolutely solid business and doing it. So the bank said to her, sure, we'll give you a loan as long as your husband signs for it too. True story. So um, she said, uh, thank you, no thank you. 
and she went to her community and she within no time was able to actually get people to support her business and it was not just her business it was the future of her business so i was a member of that program um, it was a community supported beans program she called it so every month uh, for my investment for the amount of money that i put in um, i get uh, a pound of beans and it goes on for like five years Right, so that I'm actually invested in her future. So she gets the money now so that she can invest in it, and then my payout is making sure that I get my value for that, right? Um, I've done it with a dairy in Stratford as well. Do you know how much it costs to actually build a dairy in Ontario? Like a million dollars, base, base. So like farmers are not small businesses in that sense, right? Like there's a lot going on behind the scenes, of course. Um, so, but that community supported agriculture model, which has been around since I think like the 70s or the 60s, I wanna say, um, is basically now being realized on, on the digital front, which is really interesting. So that same sort of idea where you're going to, and don't worry, but like there's not a test. <laughs> But this is just giving an idea where you know you have the borrower and the lender, and then you have the platform and how the platform actually goes in and does the interplay with lenders, right? But it actually all it's doing is enabling people to actually connect and invest in businesses. So in the states, this is more. Um, has anybody heard of the Jobs Act? So the Jobs Act is about uh, how independent people can invest in startups without actually having to be accredited investors, right? So this is enabling smaller bits of investment into startups, into small businesses to actually get them either launched or sustained, right? So that's kind of the, the purpose around the Jobs Act. Um, same sort of idea while social, fan, social finance here in Canada through Mars um, went ahead and they launched, it, uh, the, enabled the investment in social good companies uh, on the TSX. Same sort of idea. So it's enabling, it's like democratizing people to be able to invest in these without having to be an accredited investor or to have you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest. We can invest and support the ideas that we have nominally because we want to and because we have a small means of being able to do that and still actually get money back. Like it is an investment, right? Like that's the, the objective is to actually make your money back. But it's enabling us to actually respond to businesses and support the ideas that we want without it having to be obstructive, right? And, and, and so low, it's absolutely lowering the barriers um, and allowing people to do it. It's still doing it in a safe way, right? There's still security there. But I think that for me, this is one of the most exciting things that's coming our way because I think that this is, you know, it is CSA model on a larger scale, but it, it allows us not only to support, you know, companies that are doing social good, like social enterprises. I mean, that's one thing entirely, but it enables us to actually just put the money in our local community, right? And to support, like, you know, when everyone says, oh, it'd be so nice if we had like a nice theater here in town. Well, you can all invest and make that theater happen, right? In a professional, safe, secure way. So it's not like you're just giving money to some Joe who's gonna run off with it, right? And, and you know, make, a, make a, a farce out of it. Like there is a, an actual platform to, to enable that and do that. And I, so for me, this is one of the most exciting things that's coming this way. All right. So remember when I said before that uh, people are willing to pay for content? People are willing to pay for content. People are willing to pay for content. Let's look at the numbers. So we have some amazing growth numbers realized and actual and projected right now as well. And these numbers are growing, right? So how many people have cut the cord? How many people have cut the, cut the cable cord? Not yet, eh? Holding on, holding on. Do you still have movies on demand? Movie network? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is, you know, um, I mean, we, we've all heard of, you know, House of Cards and Bloodlines and all these great shows coming out of, of, of Netflix, right? And, uh, you know, the, the newer, the latest season of Arrested Development and uh, we were talking about Letter Kenny. Oh my God, Letter Kenny. If anyone's not seen Letter Kenny, let's see Letter Kenny. Oh, and it's filmed here locally, which is what I found out, which is awesome. Um, it's a little blue, you've been warned, but it's fantastically funny. Um, so uh, the thing is, is that people will pay for content. They will pay for this. They will support this, right? This is the same thing as I mentioned before about Canada Land and Patreon, right? And supporting good content. People want to see good content produced. Um, and that's it. So it's less of the spray and pray, right? So that you'll, you won't hear a lot at all upcoming um, from the main uh, cable providers right now, right? Talking about how you, like the, the new laws have come into play where you can actually piecemeal, you know, the channels that you actually want to purchase for, I think, as low as 25 
$25 a month or something versus like your baseline was I think like $89 to get into watching cable. Um, not to say there's not a lot of good content on cable, right? Absolutely, but you know, the reality is is that people can access their information online, right? And they can do it when they want, and that's probably one of the more important things, right? So, um, you know, although, although they have time shifting available, like, you know, so my experience with that was I was a Roger subscriber for like 30 years. Um, and I still use, use them for my, for my internet access at home. I just no longer subscribe to the cable services at all because really I don't spend that much time in front of a TV screen any longer. And when I do, I'm mostly watching kind of binging content, right? Like, God, I mean, you know, who's not, like, who doesn't love, like, the eight hours of, like, Lost, you know? <laughs> Especially when we've had the weather we've had for the last couple of days, right? Like, it's frigid. No one wants to go out. Like, it's better to sit at home and huddle in and, and you know, watch what you want to watch, right? Rather than flipping through content that is just what I still call it the spray and pray, right? That it's just, like, it's, it's mind-numbing and it's filling, but it's not satisfying in that sense. So... Um, so video subscriptions are certainly on the increase. We, we see that that's happening all the time, um, but also it's happening with music as well. So, uh, I mean, it's, you know, traditional TV is not going anywhere. If you look at this breakdown, you still have a majority of content is still coming from, you know, this is, of course, US-based mostly, but it's still coming from um, majority of broadcasters, right, traditional broadcasters. Uh, but yeah, you can see that the, you know, the, the providers, right, so like the advent of Vice, um, I think is really indicative of a change in content providers out there. Uh, obviously, Netflix um, as well. I mean, they are creating some of the best television, right? Orange is the New Black, House of Cards, um, and even, again, oh, like, oh, what is it? Full House? Fuller House is coming? Oh, I know. Really? We're going to watch. I know we're going to watch. We're all going to watch. Just to, just, to, just to see how bad it is, but we're all going to watch. Totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So, uh, but that's it. But look, but look at everyone smiling, right? To talk about Full House. I mean, it was, a, it was a seriously terrible show. Like, it was terrible acting and terrible everything. But exactly, but, but it was awesome because it was part of our, our lives, right? And we're going to go back and we're going to see that. So they're tapping into that kind of those, you know, that, um, that retro zeitgeist, right? Like we want to be able to kind of relive the, that simplicity and, and that kind of content. And they can and they can do it. And they're doing it really, really well. So streaming music, of course, everyone's like, you know, music is dead, the music industry is dead, not music is dead, but the music industry is dead, you know, and it's, uh, it will never have the same sort of sales they're having. Well, they are, though. Right? People want to have their music on demand. Oh, I have, oh, what that song is. Oh, I want to listen to that album. And rather than having to go through their own library, they can actually tap into a library that enables them to hear whatever song they want whenever they want to hear it. Right? And so the ability for, for people to experience that on demand is really what's driving it. And, and people are subscribing to it. Right? So those numbers are continuing to grow as well. Podcasting, as I mentioned, continues to grow. Look, like, look at those numbers. Any industry, any business would want to have that. So this is, you know, we talk about, like, you know, radio. This is basically talk radio, right? Hasn't gone anywhere. There's this whole idea, like, we all think that this is, like, incredibly, you know, this is all new, right? It's all changing. It's not really, right? These are the same ideas, just with a different bend. And, you know, so I, I, I like to kind of demystify the whole, you know, technology and impact. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some really cool stuff happening, which we'll talk about as well. But, you know, this is a lot of this is just traditional old school stuff, just in a different delivery mechanism. Doesn't mean it's not amazing and fascinating in the way that they're doing it and, and they're realizing some awesome things. Um, but it's not, this isn't brand new ideas, right? This is just creatively delivering it in a different way. Um, and print-ish, okay, digital, but journalism, you know, the numbers are still really good depending on who your outlet is. Now, I say that without absolutely, you know, not trying to be tongue-in-cheek at all, looking at the, at the, you know, the reality of traditional journalism in Canada, let's just say, right? We've had the Calgary Herald, I think. There was Ottawa Papers. Um, there's a lot of local papers that have been shut down over the last number of years. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's a really complex issue. I certainly don't have the answer. Like, I don't. I've been paying attention to the, to the issue of media criticism and journalism and the state of storytelling right across, you know, North America anyway, more kind of specifically. Um, but 
people will still pay for good content. And this is where I keep coming back to, right? So, you know, the New York Times, of course, is the pinnacle, right? It's the apex of like journalistic standards. And I'm sure they've had their, their moments too. And they've had some hiccups, absolutely. Like any organization deserves to have. It's the way we always check ourselves to make sure we don't get too ahead of ourselves or too big for our riches, so to speak. Um, but they, you know, they continue to present and create great in-depth journalism. You know, not just fluff stories, not just, you know, the pieces that you read when you're on the subway or you're on transit, right? It's, it's not those little quick hits. Like, they're actually still doing that deep dive journalism, and I think that matters, and I think people are responding to it, right? So there's always this backlash, right? It's like, oh, like someone says, oh, the attention, you know, everyone has attention deficit, like, you know, not as a disorder, but everyone has attention deficits, that they can't pay attention to anything for more than 30 seconds or for three minutes, or, you know, I think the, the line in journalism used to be, um, about as long as it takes the average person to go to the washroom, right? Like that's as long as your segment can be or your piece can be in journalism. I think that's changing again. And I think it's, it's not that it's changing. I think that people are tired of the fluff. They're tired of the skimming the surface. And, and you know, that, that satisfies a certain, you know, it satisfies a certain itch in the sense of like getting information really quickly, but people actually want to dive deeper and they want to understand things. So um, I think honestly, just culturally, uh, if you look at the film that's just come out recently, Spotlight, uh, about the Boston Globe and about the, d the deep dive investigation into uh, clergy abuse in Boston, um, right, which was the impetus to a global change, right, and, and actually disrupted the church in a huge, huge way. Um, I think that's indicative of where people actually still get emotive and they, emotional and they still respond to those kinds of big deep dive journalistic investigative dangerous pieces because that's actually where the real story is, right? So I don't think it's going anyway. I think it's, there's a bit, of a, been a bit of a backlash and I think we're coming back to that in that sense. Internet of Things and wearables. Uh, we've been hearing about Internet of Things and wearables for a long time, for sure. This is not new. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing the next wave really starting to come into play more in the connected home. I think the connected home is really going to take off this year. Uh, so whether we're talking about smart refrigerators, right, um, or uh, smart devices that, so I, the stuff that really excites me is always in the healthcare space. Like that's the stuff that actually really excites me. So, you know, you look at giving, giving people who are aging um, their independence and their ability to actually live at home on their own and still have a support system. So whether it's integrated cameras or integrated security or uh, emergency alert notifications like, oh my God, remember a medic alert, right? I've fallen and I can't get up, right? So the same sort of idea, but rather than somebody having to wear, you know, something around their neck or press the button themselves, that sensors are built into somebody's home so that they can actually, um, you know, go about their every day. And if they have a fall, then sensors would pick that up, right? Um, so those, I mean, those are just some ideas. And like, there's uh, so many different opportunities there. But I think the, uh, I think that the, I mean, energy, it's funny, right? Like, it's not funny, but it's pretty typical. These massive industries, right, these massive systems are the ones that actually start to change first. We were talking about it just before we sat down, right? The, uh, like the utilities, right? There's a lot of stuff happening in the energy space, right? Whether it be from um, power grids like the Tesla wall, right, the Tesla power wall, who's, I'm so excited. They sent me a survey this week. I'm like, yeah get closer every little bit closer right I would love to have solar panels on my roof and have my own you know my own system that actually powers my entire house and it's not so like it's it's so simple the way that they've designed it in that sense it's not the same kind of complexity um, that exists with certain infrastructure right now nonetheless as I was going where I was going with this was you know the energy Field, the energy industry is able to actually invest in kind of those big R&D questions and they're able to invest in these disruptive technologies or um, you know uh, complement existing ones that are coming out so like the nest thermostats right so we have a nest at home as well awesome in Florida it was super cold here I was able to actually adjust the heat so that my four cats at home wouldn't get cold right just peace of mind right so my house is not dropping to four degrees I was like eh, no just keep it at a baseline 19 like keep my happy I have old cats keep them happy right <laughs> but like those kinds of like simple things and I'm sitting in Florida you know and I'm using my app 
to manage it, just to make sure, you know, all I had to do was make sure that my Wi-Fi was running, right? So that's awesome. Um, those are, I mean, those are already in play. I think you're going to see that expand. Like, I mean, I know that the Nest system has expanded to security and carbon monoxide detection and all those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think the health stuff for me and that integrated home sensors is that, you know, whether it's, I mean, you, you see the smart homes, right? Smart homes are awesome if you can afford them. No one can afford them, right? And that's massive infrastructure. So you'll see them more in new homes and new developments than you will in retrofitting older homes, right? It's just, it's just the practicalities of actually trying to you know, retrofit anything is really impossible. That's why new developments in like tiny little hamlets have fiber to the home. You know, that's never going to happen in an old established neighborhood, right? It costs too much to actually rip up old roads and to implement those kinds of solutions. Uh, but yeah, I think the, like, but the, the smart homes being able to walk into a room and, you know, have your music play that you want instantly or to have your lights follow you on, turning them on and turning them off so that you're saving energy, right? So integrated from the, from the experience of your, of your home and the warmth of your home as well as, you know, energy savings, like those kinds of, again, those frictionless experiences, I think those are going to be really um, changing a lot of things as we move forward. Uh, if anybody hasn't heard about the We Are Wearables uh, meetup that happens down at Mars, uh, this is Tom Emmerich. He's a good pal. And he's a lovely guy, and he's a, he's like probably one of the leading voices on wearables, especially in Canada right now. Um, certainly growing his voice globally as well. Um, he was one of the original glass holes. God love him. He tried it out. He loved it. He you know calls himself a glass explorer, but. Everybody else didn't. Uh, <laughs> but he took one on the chin, that's for sure. But he's actually always trying out stuff in the augmented reality and virtual reality space. There's a lot of stuff happening in wearables and fashion um, and health, of course. Those are kind of the big ones. Uh, a company that I would mentioned last year uh, on the enterprise side, which is... Um, the NIMI band. Anybody heard of the NIMI band or remember the NIMI band? So NIMI is... Uh, BioNIM is the company. And it was originally, so the, I, I was talking to Carl Martin, who's the, one of the co-founders, uh, not too long ago. And it was a really interesting story because they actually did a whole crowdfunding campaign. Um, they didn't run it through Kickstarter. They did it, it was basically a pre-order campaign that they ran through their own website, right? So they actually managed it. And what they did was they did actually validate that people were interested in their product. So what their product is, um, we all have a unique EKG reading, right? So our heartbeat is as unique as our fingerprint. So the idea behind NIMI is that you could, I mean, they had this kind of future casting video, right? That you could walk up to your device and your laptop would recognize you and turn on. And you get to your car and if your car was an automatic car, you know, or automatic opener, you could walk up to your car, it would recognize you, it would, the door would open and the ignition would go on, right? So this seamless, frictionless experience, right? With, between you and your device from a security perspective, right? Same thing with banking, all of those kinds of experiences. So they went to market as, um, as a consumer product, that's how they originally started. And then they realized that they had to, they had to pivot to actually sustain their business. And so they actually went from being consumer focused to being um, enterprise focused. So imagine it, you're here at Narcat, you have your band on, you walk around the building, the doors open, you don't have to take out a card, you, you know, you're logging into your, to your uh, you know, work server from home, um, you don't, no longer need the RSA VPN little you know, docket piece that allows you to actually type in your security, your security ID so that you can get access to your online servers. You know, it allows you to do this kind of work seamlessly. Um, so, I mean, it was interesting because they, not only did they validate but they actually never took anybody's money, right? So people were like, where's my NIMI band? And they're like, we actually didn't take your money and we gave it all back. And, you know, there were still developer uh, kits if people wanted to access it. But that's how, like, wearables are actually, I think that's, again, so as I was talking about those big industries, right, big systems, they are the ones that are going to be, um, they're the ones who are actually pushing this stuff forward. Like, uh, honestly, in the wearable space, like a ring that tells me when I have a message that's not very frictionless for me. Like, it may be pretty, but it's not frictionless for me. I still have to go from my ring to my phone. And honestly, if I can't feel the butt zing, maybe I should be paying more attention or I should have another indicator. You know, what's going on? It's a personal use. Oops, sorry. Keep doing that. Personal use, right? I mean, that's for sure. Um, but I see, the, I see the enterprise stuff, actually, is the stuff that becomes more, it becomes more implemented. And that's the stuff that's actually going to change the way we actually work. And, uh, and, the, and the way we play. Not to say that there's not some beautiful pieces out there. There's like this leaf monitor, right? But it's like your Fitbit, right? Every, something like ridiculous number, like 70% of Fitbits are put away after the first six months. Like people use them and then they're so excited about them and then they never bother using them again, 
right? So, yeah, truly. Oh, that treadmill, that's coming out of my attic soon. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so. Uh, this was a piece actually that was a piece of research that was conducted by Mars. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it um, on on the potential impact of IoT for the mining industry. Uh, and um, a great piece that they had included in the, in in this was mining has traditionally been about how do they say how do they phrase it? Oh, it's about it's about moving something from point A to point B. In IoT, what it does is enables you to actually see the entire supply chain, right? So it's not just the things that are actually moving things, right? It's actually seeing the entire process and managing that entire process. So the potential is actually really quite disruptive and really quite huge. But again, it's, it's these massive industries that allow that to happen um, because they can invest in it. Right? They've also got those kind of economies of scale, right? So you can actually test this stuff out um, on, on a grander scale that actually shows people you know, that proof of concept in that sense. All right, I'd mentioned this earlier um, in a different way, but there's like, so this is like that uh, twitch, right? Like kind of watching over the shoulders, so, but just-in-time learning. So from a, from a training and learning perspective, this is not a new concept. Just-in-time learning has been around for decades. Um, and, uh, and it is about giving, I mean, the advent of the internet was huge from, a, from an education perspective. I worked in education for many years, uh, mostly in corporate education. Uh, and, Giving people access to information almost instantaneously was like, ah, you know, it was, it was the holy grail. And it was fantastic. The, what they realized is that um, corporations can capitalize on this and, comp and certain, like, certain segments can capitalize on this um, better than others. So think about it from a service industry perspective, right? So you have a new barista starting at Starbucks. Well, it's easier for them to learn in short bursts or to reinforce their learning into short bursts because what's the turnover in service, right? Turnover in service is really quite big, right, from a talent perspective. So doing this massive investment on like massive training programs and stuff all up front where people probably only retain about 30 to 40% of what they're taught up front, this is kind of this constant reinforcement of skill sets. It's constant reinforcement of updating information. So you can do this from, you know, um, I, I love this example, like how do you maintain a forklift? I would really hope people would actually have an understanding about how to manage a forklift. It's kind of probably a big piece of equipment that you want to invest in. But this is about, you know, the questions being about, you know, checking for safety, checking for wear, and reinforcing it. Or what about people who are like, maybe I work in this kind of machinery and I want to learn about that machinery and where's that kind of correlation? It's a way to actually move people along. So. Um, um, this company, Exonify, is being run by a, a very smart, very smart woman uh, in KW, uh, Carol Lehman, who um, actually, she exited her, one of her company's page rank to Google many years ago. Um, and she's been driving just-in-time learning, and they're dealing with Walmart and some other major Fortune 500 companies. Um, and you can see kind of the, the utilization there, right? So this would be like Timmy's utilizing this kind of platform, right? Like here's a new product, here's a new bit, and here's how you put it together, and it is that just-in-time learning that reinforces it. It gamifies it as well, so it makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, but education is changing a lot, like right across the board. So I'm sure you've heard of MOOCs, which are massive online courses, uh, open courses. So this is all free content that's available for MIT, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, like all some of the best universities and best providers in the world are actually providing content through MOOCs. Um, and then there's also now this idea, though, of accreditation, which I really love. So Mozilla Open Badges is this project. I love Mozilla. Mozilla is a, not only is it a good browser, but it's a great company. They, they very much push, push for the open web and collaboration, and it's just part of their culture, which is an amazing, uh, they're, they're creating some amazing things. Um, but what they're doing with Open Badges is they're looking at people getting accreditation no matter where they've learned their skill sets, right? So whether it's online through a certified program provider or it's in practical skills, it's building accreditation so that you can actually say, I know this and I can validate how I know this, um, rather than having to pay somebody $20,000 to, you know, do, you could do an MBA online right now for free. Like, I think there's a number of universities actually that through Coursera and I think there's another platform that are actually offering an MBA online for free. So you can do all of the course material for free. If you want to be able to put MBA after your name, you have to pay somebody $20,000. So you can do all the course material on your own. You can learn it all on your own. 
but to still get those three initials, you need to pay a university $20,000. I don't think that's working any longer. Um, there's a great university out there called University of the People, where you can get a degree, so you can still do a four-year degree. If you look at the providers, if you look at the, uh, the instructors, they're all MIT, Yale, you know, UCLA, like some of the world's most prominent schools and providers and professors and teachers out there, and it costs you $100 per exam. So you can do an entire four-year program for $4,000, right? So all you're paying for is the exam, 100 bucks for exam, right? So uh, there's a TED Talk on this if you want to check it out too, University of the People. I think it's fascinating and it's a total equalizer because what it does is it's giving actually access to that education globally. So to people who wouldn't typically have that, abs that access, you know, think about people who are disenfranchised, think about people who are at the poverty line, think about people who are uh, in, in countries that don't have that kind of ready access to education. Now all of a sudden it's more democratized, right? I think that's, for me, that's fascinating and really exciting. Uh, then you have companies, or companies, you have schools like Make School and the App Academy. Now I love this idea. Again, this has been going on for a few years, so this isn't new, but I think it's, it's worth noting at this point. So they don't, they don't take tuition. So, so, so Make School and App Academy are specifically like developing, right? So you're learning developing languages and you're learning how to code. But they don't pay, you don't pay a tuition. They take a portion of your future earnings. So that's how they do the model. So if you get hired, then you pay them a portion of your future earnings. So this is mostly in direct response to the crippling debt that happens for post-secondary students, mostly out of the US, certainly Canada as well. But what a brand new creative way for people to actually gain real skills and not go into ridiculous debt, but also to be able to sustain their alumni. Like that's, you know, if you think about any kind of alumni program through any university or college, they're always about, you know, get back to the university, get back to the university. Well, I already paid you for my education. Why am I giving you more money, right? So I, I love this model with Make School and App Academy. I think it's really, really smart. And I think it's, uh, I think it's gonna be making a, like, a major, major impact as the years go on, for sure. Oops. And back. So ad blocking. Ad blocking is something that is real. Ad blocking is something that is happening. Um, who uses an ad blocker? Don't worry, you're not on camera. I won't tell on you. Anybody use an ad blocker? So there's a lot of browsers that actually have ad blocking extensions now. What that means is when you go to YouTube, you won't see the beginning ad. And when you go to websites, you'll see a lot of white space and less ads that are in kind of impugning your experience. Um, and it is an actual thing that is growing <clears throat> and it's growing pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what's behind it. I think it's a bit of both. Right? I think it is that I don't wanna buy right so stop throwing stuff at me i always find it really annoying too like have you ever been looking for a pair of shoes or a laptop or a something and then you either buy it or you don't buy it and then you're on facebook and then the next thing you see in your stream is that exact same product it really annoys me when i've already bought the product i'm like i've already bought the product like there's got to be a way from there to get smarter so that's where i think part of it is it's just that experience right it's that user experience of like i already bought it catch up with me reflect what I'm actually doing, not what you think I was doing a day ago, right? So, you know, the, that kind of, the tracking and the cookies technology has a ways to go to catch up. Um, but I don't know if it is a political statement. I don't know if it is a backlash to bad UX. I think it's a bit of both. I don't think it's one or the other. Um, but it is a $28.1 billion ad revenue loss, loss uh, to advertisers. Now, of course, the, the complexity is, is that Advertisers enable content, right? And if you're not seeing those advertisers' pieces, then you may not be getting the same content, right? So that's, I mean, this is the struggle in the journalism, this is the struggle in print, like this is the same struggle right across the board. I don't have the answer, for sure. Um, but I mention this because I think it's something, if you're gonna be doing advertising online, I think it's something that you'd be, you have to be really, really mindful of. So this is where I don't, I've, I've never been a proponent of, and I don't believe in the spray and pray. I don't think you can, you know, I, used to, I love it when traditional, you know, uh, traditionalists will say like, you know, oh, well, I can put an ad in the paper and get 25,000 eyeballs on that. I'm like, really? Validate that, prove that. How'd you get 25,000 eyeballs on your ad? Right, you can't. Distribution to a market doesn't mean that you can actually validate those numbers. 
with digital, you can validate it a bit more, but it's still only potential eyeballs. Like, there's no guarantee of anything. So for me, it's always been, and you hear me say this time and time again when I visit, it's about the story. It's about the brand. It's about being relevant. It's about being relevant. It's about telling people about you, about your product, about your service, about what you do, and having it resonate. You know, it, unless you're trying to really do like the spray and pray and just, you know, get, the, you know, a buck here and a buck there, you know, I don't think that, that that's a sustainable way of actually doing business, right? So the way of doing business is actually providing value to your market. And I think that they'll respond in kind. So, but ad blocking is certainly something that you need, you, you want to consider and you want to take into account um, before you start spending any kind of money uh, in that space. All right, photo sharing. I know we're getting close on time. I should move it ahead. Uh, so this is more than the selfie. I love this picture. Terrifies me. Just terrifies me. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard about you know a number of people who have gone to their death based on the selfie, right? People who have like taking a picture back over a cliffside and fallen off the cliff or gotten taken over by a wave or I don't know what happened to this guy, I hope he survived, you know? Um, but photo sharing is actually more than just about um, the selfie. Uh, is anybody familiar with this, with this campaign? So this is, an, uh, this is a photographer out of Europe and he, um, this was uh, a project that he did with his then girlfriend, now wife, um, called Follow Me Too. And every, so they go around the world and every picture is her leading him um, in a different space. And if you have to check about it on Instagram, it is some of the most stunning photography I've ever seen. Like it is so, so beautifully well done. And she's always, you know, decked out in, in kind of the, in, in, in situ, right? Like she's very much a part of the storytelling and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and he's just, you know, just a photographer and it was just a project that he started. But it was so compelling. Like, Millions of people are following this, you know, millions of people are, are part of this storytelling. Um, and, but it's so, I mean, that's, it's still the video and, you know, and imagery, it's, it's massive part of storytelling, but now it's become more about purposeful sharing, right? So that photo sharing is becoming way more niche and, more, and way more specific. So this is Pout, this is another company that's just recently, KW's had some good stuff happening lately. Um, so they just got acquired by a company called Ever Album, um, which is one of the bigger uh, Valley companies uh, in regards to photo sharing. Um, and, uh, but their, their content is all about, um, and their content is all about fashion. Right? So everybody who's on that platform is sharing stuff about either style or pieces. Right, so it's it's less about you know this isn't this isn't about posting stuff on Facebook going look at my fun new purse. This is actually about posting in a community that's very specific to that space. Right, so the photo sharing is becoming uh, is becoming more specialized, right, and more niche, so that you're not just posting on Instagram. That's one thing. I mean, that's where that you know follow me too program was and that campaign was. Um, but something like Pout is becoming a lot more specific to a very specific audience. And that's, I think, where, where that photo sharing is changing for sure. And the good news is for Pout too is that they'll be staying in KW and then they'll be um, hiring more people and bringing them down from the valley and actually expanding the business down there. So it's good news for them. Drones. Everyone loves drones. I got my boys little drones this year. They're like this big. They're so cute. I have no idea. I have no idea how to control them. They're like, it's really hard. Has anyone tried a drone yet? Yeah, they're hard, right? Like, if they're not easy to control. So uh, piloting is not easy. Um, but, you know, we've, so I think everyone was starting to talk about drones when um, Amazon was talking about, you know, delivery. And they, what was it, the Super Bowl? No, I can't remember. It was like two years ago, right? It was like the Super Bowl or something, and it was all about, you know, immediate delivery of product, um, which I think absolutely for sure will happen. There will be pizza delivery. There will be things that are happening. But actually, again, it's, it's massive industry that's really changing um, this kind of technology, right? So um, in, the, in the drone space, this is where you actually have access and autonomy. And this is, this is going to be one of those compelling business reasons why these things are, are moving ahead. So so precision agriculture, right? So being able to spray um, or being able to manage or being able to take, you know, stock of specific parts of, of a farm operation, right? Or a massive industry operation. Um, disaster response. So that would be um, being able to deliver an AED device to somebody remotely and being able to give people instructions. So that's the, the previous picture is actually, there was a real life example of a startup that is, there's an emergency call that comes in 
it's a, it's a, you know, it's a heart attack victim. And they're able to deliver the drone straight to the person, you know, get the drone to them. And then as they, like, they could be in a mall or something and they go outside, grab the drone, run it to the victim. And then there's a broadcast speaker that actually runs them through step by step, everything to do to actually prepare people and then be able to give them an AED, right? So if they're AED, I know AEDs are, you know, more prevalent now, but talking about remote access, right, and remote sites, um, this gives them actually access to that a lot more than it used to. Um, so mining and quarrying, of course, being able to actually check, uh, go into this was, this is actually the canary, right? Drones can be the canary, right? They get to actually go into places that are not safe for people or we have to do, you know, you're doing pre and post checks uh, on access, right? So those are opportunities, massive opportunities there as well, right? And, and, and infrastructure, so architecture, right? Being able to go into, into building uh, sites and actually check out the progress, right? And being able to do it remotely, right? So you could actually have an architect that's in, you know, North Carolina and have a project that's going on in Dubai and actually being able to manage it and being able to see the progress on a, on a project and being able to do inspection on that, right? So these are all, I mean, progressive, of course, these are not happening overnight in that sense, but there's definitely people who are actually already using the technology to do this, right? Besides, oh, there's also um, really powerful drones that allow you to go skiing, like flat line skiing, like they'll pull you along like a sled, I swear to God. I should have put the video up, but there is. There's like, you know, people who are holding onto drones and the drones are pulling them along and they're basically like wind sailing with a drone on a ski board or on a snowboard, right? Yeah. There's always gonna be that part of technology that gets used for whatever, because we can, right? All right, 360 degree video. This is the kind of the advent of the new video stuff. Has anyone here seen this yet? Oh my God, okay, please on your phone, do a search for Blue Angels, Blue Angels video, and then take it and on your phone, you can literally turn around and get that view. So when you're, you're watching it, you can tilt up, you can see what the pilot sees, you can tilt, tilt down, you can see what the pilot sees, you can turn, you can see the other planes around you, and then you literally turn your, you turn your, your phone around and you can see the guy filming from behind. It is fascinating. Do they? Yeah, yeah. Like, so there's a whole YouTube channel out there, just do YouTube 360 videos, and you can wa watch it either on your browser and you just, Scan, you move your mouse across and it'll change the view, or on your phone and you literally physically change your view and it actually follows you. I love that stuff. Like it's just, it's just amazing, right? It's really, really exciting stuff. And of course, it's just a fuller tele, you know, storytelling experience, right? So you get a lot of behind the scenes stuff and that's what it is, right? It's really, really immersive. And, uh, and I think it's really compelling. And so, like, I mean, this is, you know, certainly you have somebody like Star Wars or you have the, the, you know, the franchise like Star Wars that has the money to invest in this kind of stuff, right? Um, but, uh, but I love the Blue Angels one because it's really like, oh, wait, okay, now granted it's pilots, right? But you've got two pilots, just two pilots sitting in a, in a cockpit and they're able to actually translate their experience as well. And when you see it, like you can see that the other planes are like 10, 20 feet ahead of them, like on top of them rather, like it's that close and it's, yeah, it's pretty compelling stuff. So pretty fascinating. Virtual reality. So uh, it's, you know, it's already a billion, it's a great picture, right? It's a billion, billion dollar business. Like it's, you know, billions already in it, but it's a very niche market. So I don't know, has anyone tried any VR stuff yet? Like, you know, has anyone sat down with an Oculus right after? Anyone tried the Google Cardboard? Right, Google Cardboard is like 30 bucks or something. So it's like totally accessible and it's, and it's pretty amazing. And you can, you can, again, Google a couple of, you know, videos of just watching seniors, you know, really immerse themselves in it and, and experience it. It's still right now fun. Right? There's not a lot of practical use, or not, not that there's not practical use. People aren't using it practically yet. Right? I think that there's still um, access to the technology and the cameras and everything else is still, is still very, um, very much uh, on a growth path. Right? But absolutely can be used for gaming and for content creators. You know, the, the practical use being military, right? architecture, emergency response, like putting people in situ, giving them an experience of what it actually feels like, you know, being in the theater of war. Right, or being on a construction site or being in a mine, right? And so giving people kind of access to that information or that experience and giving them a practical, you know, um, uh, a practical experience with it. There's a new quantum something out of Toronto, I think, that was recently, uh, I recently tried out their new, their new camera. But here's the thing, and this is important, that it's, um, oh, did I miss this? I think, did I miss one, one slide? I did. Um, so this is still a niche community that is predominantly managed by men. 
And the problem is, is that men and women experience virtual reality differently. It's a total biological, like physiological makeup. The way we process information in our brains is actually different. We have, I don't know if it's the, I can't remember, I, there's a couple of research papers on it, but it's, it's um, how, we actually, how we actually interpret information and we take it in is actually processed differently, um, visually. So the, the problem being is that, um, and, and I was surprised that actually this company in Toronto didn't, realize, did, like, didn't know this about, about this, but when I first sat down with the Oculus Rift and I tried it, I did a roller coaster. So granted, they're like, sit down. And I'm like, no, no, I'm fine. They're like, no, 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 sit down. And I was like, okay. So I sat down and I was like, holy crap, I'm really glad I was sitting down. Um, but one of the things they didn't, they didn't um, adjust for is women experience it different. So if you actually go through a women's experience on, on virtual reality, um, women get nauseous a lot more. It's just the way we process differently than men do. And of course, this is being built by men predominantly for men because that's their test bed, right? So I only mention it because A, I'm a feminist, but also B, because I think it's important when you think about those, those elements of design, right? And what impacts the design and what impacts uptake and what impacts um, people taking on new technologies, right? If it maintains a niche design from upfront, then it's going to take that much longer for adoption, right? Across mass adoption, right? So you're missing half of the market, half of a potential market when you're not paying attention to those kinds of design considerations. So I thought it was one of those really interesting things that we should be mindful of. Also, uh, I'm gonna butcher her name, Helen Papiagianis close maybe, uh, is, uh, is an AR uh, expert here in Canada. Um, and so my PSA for her and for everybody is, Virtual reality is not the same as augmented reality. So I don't know if anyone's seen this video, but it's a bunch of kids. It's only like about 15 seconds long, but it's a bunch of kids sitting in a school gym, and all of a sudden this massive blue whale comes up and you know does basically like a swan dive right in the middle of the gym, and everyone is like you can see everyone just kind of talking and then hole in their eyes and everyone's losing their minds and it's like this huge massive experience and it's awesome to watch. That's augmented reality, right? That is made through projection of cameras and lenses and whatnot, different from a virtual reality, which is you are immersed 100, 360 degrees in an experience. So VR is not the same as AR, um, although people do kind of uh, think that they are, or they, they mix that up a lot. So um, I'd mentioned that I wanted to kind of keep some ideas in mind as we were looking through you know, these trends. Um, so, oops, so two things. The first is, is that idea of, of that friction and, and frictionless, right? So you can see this, so this is Twitter, Facebook, and um, I think it's Google. Google Play, maybe. Um, but what you can see is what they have circled there is the buy button. And so what, what these platforms are doing is they're and creating the opportunity for people to remember, as I said, stay, stay in the environment, right? So Facebook especially. Um, but they want to be able to make it frictionless so that literally you see something that you like, something comes up, you can buy it, and it's done. One click and you buy it, right? So this notion of frictionless experience, that's basically, if you look at everything from the FinTech to the just-in-time learning, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. The, the companies that are experiencing success are the ones that are actually thinking frictionless. That's the design consideration that actually pushes them forward, right? So, you know, when you don't, uh, has anybody ever, has anybody moved from like a Windows environment to a Mac environment? Okay, yeah, so I was terrified because I, I was always a Windows person. My whole, I mean, I've been using literally WordPerfect since it was like 1.0. And so to actually switch over to Mac, I was like, I don't know, I was really nervous, I wanted to. My husband liked the commercials, so he's like, you should just do it. You know, I'm a Mac guy, I'm a PC guy, like he likes the commercials, that's as much consideration as he puts into it. I had a lot more to consider beyond that. Um, but for me, I, I mean, yes, it's a beautiful design, the experience of opening up an Apple box and everything else, awesome, like that whole experience is pretty amazing. For me, I was, I, I was totally uh, just won over when I went to replace my router and I plugged in my Apple router and it said, do you wanna use the same settings that you had for the last router that you had plugged in? Yes, please. That was it. Like for me, I was like, that wins, right? Because it was completely frictionless, intelligent, intuitive. 
you know, plain language, the design experience that they gave me of making a decision and actually tying into the work that I'd already done, you know, very manually, you know, previously, that's that kind of frictionless experience, right? So that's, that's an, an, another example of what I mean by that. So the companies that are winning, the examples that are winning are the ones that are actually capitalizing on that frictionless experience, okay? Uh, and I also wanted to mention something because I was at a, an event recently and there was somebody who was talking about kind of analog is the new killer. And remember how I said about podcasting? Podcasting isn't, yes, the delivery mechanism is different, but this is basically talk radio, right? But it's talk radio on demand. So 27 years ago, I worked at Saatchi and Saatchi Advertising, um, which at the time was the largest advertising agency in the world. And I was a young woman who was, you know, it was Mad Men days, like we could smoke at our desks and I was called a secretary, right? Uh, but one of the things I learned from uh, one of our VPs then, who ended up becoming the president of Saatchi, uh, Liz Torley, uh, was she, and this is well before the internet, like this is well before the internet, um, but she had done this research piece and she had shared it with the team then and she talked about these 20 year cycles of culture and consumption. How we, like every 20 years or so, we kind of change from this bling to this nesting experience. So think about it. So anybody who was around in the 80s, not you guys, obviously, but anyone who was around in the 80s, down and going, well, uh, it, was, it was excess, right? Think American Psycho, right? It was, all, it was all watermark business cards and big shoulder pads and all the latest and greatest, and it was all bling, right? And then it turned into like serious bling with like gold teeth and caddies and the whole thing, right? Um, and then what happened when the 2000s hit? Nesting local market, 100 mile diet, yoga, right? So this whole culture changed. Now we're actually watching it go again, right? So we're kind of on that tail end of this 20 year cycle and it's coming back again. So you're gonna watch this kind of move again to like excess and keeping up with the Joneses and bling, 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 and it'll be a new word for it, right? Um, but it's coming. So I mention it because now I'm like 30 years into this knowledge and I'm actually watched this cycle and it's been fascinating for me to watch. So it actually, so when everyone goes, oh, analog is a new killer, right? The return of vinyl, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, this stuff has never gone away. We are just in the midst of a 20 year cycle. So don't get snowed by people who are thought leaders who say that this is like a brand new thing that's coming back, it's not. We always, we always have a backlash to the artisan, right? So whenever it gets too produced, everything becomes too produced, we go to the handmade. Right? It's, it, it's completely cyclical. So you're going to watch this. So we've got another few years of this kind of nesting, you know, feeling this good way. And then, so we're going to go from like the 80s power strut. Oh my God, did I want to be J.C. Wyatt and Baby Boom? I wanted to be her so much. I wanted that white coat so much. Um, but it was like, you know, the 80s power strut, right? To now, of course, it's more about being authentic and sitting in your experience and slowing down and experiencing things differently, right? But you're going to watch, you know, that power strat come back again before we revert again back to the cycle. So that's it for the day. Thanks, guys. Thank you.